Hey everyone, here uh, with Tennis Sandgren, world number 41 for take two of the Tennis Cake, Tennis Takes podcast. Um, first off, just want to say thanks for joining me and just wanted to talk a little bit first about your year so far. Uh, major congrats winning your first title in Auckland a couple weeks ago. Uh, was that something that, you know, you felt your preparation was really good going in or was it more a little bit of a surprise uh, that you were able to kind of win so easily? Uh, I definitely feel like my preparation was good going in. Uh, I had a really good, you know, month and a bit uh, in December. Uh, you know, we don't get much time to train, but I felt like I got a lot out of it. Uh, then Brisbane the week before was tough. I had a tough first round match, uh, but I got a lot out of it. I, I kind of cramped up in the third set, but it was good to have such a physical match under my belt uh, going into the second week. And, you know, I worked hard on my serve going up into that event and I started serving really well, which we all know that helps a lot uh, to be getting free points in the serve. And, you know, one match turns into two and then turns into three and you find yourself in the semis and then finals. And, and it's kind of hard not to, you know, give it everything you have to try and take advantage of those, those moments there where um, you can actually make some ground points wise. Um, so I was just trying to do my best. And obviously I knew I had a lot of points coming up on the table in the following week. Um, <laughs> So I knew that, you know, I'd be disappointed with myself if I didn't give it everything I had. Right. But I mean, but were you really putting extra pressure on yourself or what was the mindset knowing you had to defend points to stay in the top hundred? Um, but at the same time, I know, you know, as a former player, when you start doing that, it makes it sometimes a little bit harder to stay in the moment. But what was your kind of mindset well, going in trying to do that? I put I put extra pressure on myself in December. Um, I wanted all my pressure to be on on me um, in the training leading up to it to make sure that I was doing everything right. Um, and that I was giving myself the best chance leading up to the events. And then once you get into tournaments, obviously, you're trying to be relaxed and trying to, you know, just stay focused and stay in your routines and, and do everything that you know to do to compete well. Um, then I just wanted to leave it out on the court to not let my let the mental side of my game deteriorate out there and, and affect me negatively. That, that I would have been really disappointed in and, and just to make sure that I gave myself the, you know, the best chance to play well. So not, not really any added pressure. Maybe by the finals, I was thinking, all right, you know, they're going to have to drag you off this court yeah. because, you know, this is a big, it's for a hundred points. It's a big, you know, it's a big deal. First title. Um, yeah. I wanted to leave it all out there, but I, I don't, so I don't think any extra pressure during the event per se, but definitely leading up to the event uh, in the off season. I, I definitely, um, you know, took every day individually and just did the best that I could um, every day to make sure that I, I wasn't leaving anything on the table going into the beginning of the year so i wasn't yeah, thinking true. oh man i wish i would have trained harder in, in december that's exactly what i didn't want for um, sure so I, I i was i was leaning towards you know as a as a you know i guess as an athlete but tennis player you're never sure exactly how much to do because you don't want to get hurt so you're like well i don't want to injure myself but i also want to train hard so you're kind of find, trying to find that balance um and i i told myself that i'd be more comfortable leaning towards hurting myself <laughs> than not because i wanted to like i said just not leave anything on the table Right. No, that makes total sense. Uh, do you think having that close final in Houston last year against Stevie, um, you know, maybe helped you in the moment in the final, just knowing it's your second time around and knowing kind of what the nerves you would expect going in? Right. I, I think so. I think so. You know, at the end of that match with Stevie, I, uh, the mental side of my game kind of collapsed just a little bit. I let some things bother me uh, that I shouldn't have. So I left that match, you know, ha I felt like I performed well, but I felt like uh, – I just didn't give myself a chance to win at the very end. I kind of slipped a little bit. Um, and so I knew how bad that felt. And I didn't want that to be the case in, in, this, in my second final. So we actually had an interesting first five games. Uh, I went up two love, had break points for three love, didn't break. Uh, lost my serve at 30. So obviously, you know, could have easily held there. And then I had break, I had love 40 on his serve at two all and he gets back to deuce. Yeah. So I'm thinking at deuce at two all. I'm like, this could easily be five love double break or triple break, like easily. And now it's two all deuce. And I don't have a good history with him as far as, you know, win loss. He's won the last three times we played. Um, but I kind of in that moment, I kind of had that, you know, seesaw where it's like, okay, are we going to mentally engage, re-engage here? Or are we going to let the fact that you're not winning in this mystical score you have in your head, uh, bother you to the point where it affects your game and so i was able to kind of pull it back and play two good points and snag the break um and, and i think that that kind of changed the momentum of the match there but that would be definitely something that i knew i didn't want to if, you know in those kind of back and forth moments where you don't know if you're going to hold on mentally i i going into the match i knew that i didn't want to go the wrong way because i knew right. how that felt because i had already done that in a final 
Um, and so I just didn't, I did not want that to happen. And, and my game was able to elevate in those moments. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, well, good stuff. Um, talk a little bit about the kind of that transition from going from Auckland on a Saturday, winning the tournament, and then going straight to Monday to the Australian Open, having to play first round just because you kind of got a little unfortunate with the side of the draw you were on. Um, so right. talk about that roller coaster of having to go from Saturday winning your first title to then, you know, having less than 40 or about 48 hours before playing a Grand Slam match. Right. Um, it was definitely interesting. You know, you, if we finished on the later side on Saturday, you know, it was, I think it was a 3, 2.30 final. So by the time you're done with everything, it's 6.30, 7. And then you're, you know, going to dinner. And then dinner, you know, you're, you have to pack. We had an early flight the next morning, I think like 6.30 or 7 a.m., four-hour flight. So not a whole lot of sleep gets done in there. I mean, I was still really amped by midnight. You know, you're, you're, you have all kinds of good endorphins going um, after a big win like that. And so it's tough to get to sleep. And then, you know, the next day is kind of a whirlwind uh, where you're getting to the courts after a four-hour flight and you're trying to just get a brief hour on the court, strike a few balls. It's different conditions, different weather. Um and then, you know, nighttime preparation and you're kind of all of a sudden you're waking up and it's your match day again. And, and uh, you haven't had really any time to prepare. And I had a good night's sleep, thankfully, before I played. But I felt like I needed maybe one more day to, to feel really comfortable. But I at least knew that the other the other three guys that were in my position also had Monday starts. So it's like, well, you know, I just didn't want I didn't want to perform, you know, not well because of the fact that I let that get to me. Uh, before I even stepped out on the court. So I tried to just clear all that stuff out beforehand. You know, all those excuses like, oh, well, you played Saturday and you had a good week and it's okay if it doesn't go that well. Like all that stuff, I just tried to clear it out before I even stepped on the court um, so that that wouldn't be something going through my mind. But it definitely affected me out there um, just as far as being a little mentally drained. I was a little mentally, emotionally drained. Physically, I felt pretty good. Um, I felt like I could have lasted uh, the whole five sets if it went there, but, you know, I felt like I was fighting myself from the, from the very beginning, uh, which, you know, it's tough. It's tough, but he played well. And, and he actually came up really big in the fourth set. He did some really good things. I was almost, almost went up double break five, two in the fourth to, to potentially serve it out and go into a fifth set. But he, he had none of that for me. So, but it was tough. Definitely. Gotcha. I gotcha. Well, uh, you have any predictions for uh, the rest of the tournament going on right now? I guess you got what Nadal and uh, Tsitsipas, and then right. Novak and uh, Pui, surprise right. semifinalist right there. Right. Um, well, I mean, before the tournament started, I thought Novak and Rafa were the favorites. Uh, I mean, when they're healthy, they're the two best players in the world right now. I think, um, and it seemed like they were healthy. Well, Rafa was maybe kind of a question mark. With it, with how he how he let up, but it seemed after his first two rounds that he was fine. So, um, they're they're all I think they're always the favorites if they're healthy. But it's kind of strange. It's like this this Australian Open's kind of like a changing of the guard, a little bit with some of the younger guys making good moves with with uh, Stefanos and and Francis. But then it's the same. You know, it's still the semis, but you would think that it might be the same two guys in the final. We'll see with, you know, either Novak or Rafa winning the tournament. So it's like, yeah, not, not so fast, guys. You know, I think I think they have a, at least a few more years where they're going to be dominant um, while, while some young guys make pushes and, and have really good uh, results as well. So it's kind of that interesting, uh, you know, it is kind of like a change in the guard, but not really. <laughs> right. So, no, yeah, it, it is. It's true. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think it's amazing, honestly, just physically how hard, like I know that, We've talked in the past, just especially slams, but even in Australia, because it's summertime down there, just how physical the game is. And when you're playing right. five sets and you can be out there, I mean, really up to five hours, um, just how these guys can, one, just even during that match do it, but then come back, you know, every two days and keep performing right. at the highest level. I saw early in the tournament, um, you know, especially first, second rounds, some of the more inexperienced guys, mostly younger, but just inexperienced slam guys seem to, you know, struggle you know, three sets in, like the guy was up two sets to love on the Shikori first round, and then you had mm -hmm. Munar first round against Bognini. How, I guess, have you learned, um, or have you even perfected kind of how to feel your body? I mean, I know a lot of it's being in the best shape you can be. That's number one. Right. But then right. even if you're in great shape, if you're not doing the correct recovery or the correct, you know, just be fueling yourself food-wise, mm -hmm. hydration-wise, you're not going to make it. And um, I didn't know if you'd picked up any tips like over the years, because now you've played more slams the last right. 
I guess, two years than you had going forward. And it's just a different animal. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, there's, a, there's three sides to that, I guess, which is the, the, the amount of work you put in beforehand, obviously, as far as fitness is concerned and time spent on court. And then there's your fuel, both before the match, you know, your fuel and hydration and during the match, if you're able to you know, keep up with some calories and making sure you're getting enough fluids in and things like that. Um, and then your really your emotional control on the court and how much physical effort you're putting in point after point, because you kind of have to conserve yourself and not burn too much energy while still playing at the level that is capable of winning at, in, at the time. You know, it's like finding that right balance and balancing out your output with what exactly you're getting out of it on the court. And then, you know, trying to hold on to like, you know, your four alls or five alls. And then, and then if you can sneak up a couple points on the guy serve, then you put in a bunch of energy to see if you can try and snag a break. But if he goes up 30 love or 40 love, just to kind of shrug it off because you can't afford to, I, most guys anyway, you know, you see some guys just, you know, only a couple really in particular that play every point you know, right. as hard as they can. But I think most guys kind of have to, bide their time a little bit and inject themselves into the match when the score is, is, is fitting. Um, you, like, you don't want to go down in your serve and lose your serve. So that's obviously a time to really buckle down. Right. And if you do get up on the other guy's return game or, if, or just to start the return game in a big moment, just with a ton of energy. And I thought from what I've seen from Sitsi Pass, I thought he's doing that extremely well, actually. Like he, he really rides the energy waves extremely well, where once it's a big moment, and the scoreline's kind of close. He just puts all his energy into those moments and pumps himself up and gets super positive. And even if he loses the point, it doesn't bother him because he knows that this is the moment where it's if he can put as much positive energy into those particular score lines that it's going to be favorable for him, or at least he believes that, which that's exactly what you have to do. And so, and it's, and it's worked for him. It's worked for right. him really, really well. Um, I think, was it last round? I think in the second set, he was a little bit on a down against Batista Agu. Yeah, he was down 4-2. Uh, in, the, in the second, is that right? Yeah, yeah uh, maybe that was, that was third. Maybe that was third. And then the, the, yeah, then the third set, he kind of dragged into the third set. And I actually had to mute the TV because the, the commentators were just hammering Tsitsipas for not putting in like a full amount of effort. And I'm like, he just yeah. won a set 7-5 and he's down yeah. in the second. And he just had like a brutally hard, he's had like two really difficult matches, the five sets with Bachelas really, and then, a really tough match, obviously, with Fed, four sets, emotional right. win, whatever. Like, he's not Superman. He's going to be a little fatigued. He's not going to play perfect. Right. Um, and they were handling him really hard. And I'm like, just wait, guys. Like, yeah. <laughs> hold on. And so once I actually muted the TV, I could actually start to see what he was doing and, and how he brought himself back into that match in the third set. And then in the fourth set, again, just when it got close, he – threw himself into the match and it, it was like it was really cool to see so he's he seems like he's got that down really well and i think that's why he's lasting so well in this tournament even though he's is he 20 yeah he's 20 he's 20 yeah. and and i mean he's playing the points really physical but it seems like uh he's learned fast how to kind of ride that emotional wave correctly um to last that long because if you treat it like a sprint um, you'll, you'll, I mean, you'll burn yourself out so fast. I think that's what you were right. saying from some of those younger guys early. It's like, well, you kind of have to, right? They don't know how their game's going to match up against what, um, with the guy that Camille, who, who went five sets with Bognini or with, um, Nisha Corey and died. In, right. In the, yeah. In the fifth set. I mean, well, you, you died know, in the third, died in the right. third set. Right. 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 Well, he has no idea how his game's going to match up against Nisha Corey. So he's like, well, I gotta, I gotta bring it all out from the very beginning. And so, yeah, it's, you're going to burn yourself out really quickly. Whereas Kay is thinking, well, I know what level I have to play. I know what's too much for me. I know when I need to bring it back in because I won't last. I won't be able to conserve myself. Um, so that's something you learn with experience. And so I think that's why it takes a little bit of time for some of these younger guys to figure that out in slam. So when you do see a young guy make a really big push in a slam, it's kind of surprising because they haven't really had right. that time and they haven't had the reps um, to figure that stuff out. But so the fact that he has uh, Tsitsipas is, is pretty cool to see for sure. Yeah, I think that's the two most important impressive things about him is one like kind of that emotional maturity that you know he had some set points and some things that he didn't get and he kind of didn't even play his best tennis but it was kind of just like locked into the next point not a lot of negative energy spent and like right. you were saying you can't afford the waste energy especially when you're not even on you know you haven't tapped on full right now it's, it's you know he's teetering a little bit mm -hmm. and then uh, obviously just his athleticism has kind of really impressed me just being able to kind of turn defense into offense and spots really good defender I mean, yeah, you wouldn't think he could. Really difficult spots in the court, and he keeps it deep. He plays it high when he needs time. Like he's not just going for like the winner 
deep in the court. He plays a high, deep shot, and, and guys obviously now are a little bit more wary to come to the net because of what it's like to get past. It's a scary yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of scary up there, but he is actually a really good defender. I was surprised to see to see. Yeah, that. and I guess this is kind of a transition to the next question I wanted to ask. So, I mean, you spent a lot of time in challengers, like developing for a multitude of reasons. You had injury and other things happen. But what would you say, I guess, um, you know, what's the difference between a guy ranked 150 that's in challengers between and then the guy that's ranked like 80? That's pretty well set getting in slams and maybe not getting in the masters, but he's, you know, a top 100 guy that's there. It's like, you know, everybody talks about the small margins in tennis, but you've actually been there. Like you've gone from 150, then you've gone to 80. Now you're at 40. It's like, what is, what is kind of like, are there any tangible differences maybe game-wise or is it mostly emotional? I think there's always, you know, one or two game things that you could probably improve upon. I mean, I think at all times, really. Like, there's a couple things that you know that if you got those things just a little bit better, uh, your, your game and your ranking would improve. Um, but I, I do think a lot of it is emotional maturity and, and how you go about not just you know, the big matches, but just your day-to-day -day routines, like how well you're able to stay mentally fresh on the road, you know, by, it's easy maybe by week one or two of the year, but by like week 27 <laughs> in the year, like, are you still mentally capable of putting forth your best effort? Um, and you'll see, you know, you'll see guys, I'm very aware of what's going on at Challenger. So you'll see guys play well for a couple of weeks and then they'll take you know, like a month off on the tour where they're, they're playing, but they're not really there, you know, they're not really engaged um, every day. And so that's tough because, you know, if you're not putting in every week, then somebody else is, and somebody's more than happy to take that spot ahead of you. Um, and and I, I, one thing that I think is kind of a big deal um, is that everybody has kind of some sort of problem, whether it's like an emotional hang up where they'll get frustrated at, at kind of the same thing. They'll have like a fatal flaw per se. You'll see that a lot where somebody either tends to miss the same ball, like their forehand gets a little bit weak on a slice in big moments and you'll see them get tight on it. Or, or if they get a bad call, they'll freak out this guy right here. Um, you have some sort of an emotional hang up or some sort of a game hang up that, that is a recurring pattern because everybody's really good, but it's like, you're going to, you tend to make the same mistake and, and, and you feel like you're hit, hitting your head against the wall a little bit. And I think being able to be honest with yourself and identify those one or two things and really, work on it and work on it over and over and over again because you don't really have any other choice or anything better to do really than try and better yourself in those small um, areas that make a big difference um, if they keep happening in a recurring pattern. Uh, and, I, and I really think they do. If you, if you go watch, um, if you spend a lot of time watching challengers, I think you'll see that with, with guys that they'll, they'll make kind of the same mistakes. And if you can identify those and try and work on those uh, and really get them better, actually, you know, maybe not make them a strength, but at least not make those things a liability. Um, like for me, if I can turn, you know, I, and I think I have to a certain extent is turn my mental game into more of a strength than, than a weakness and something that's going to let me down, um, in, in moments on the court. Uh, if I, if I can do that in some capacity, then, or I knew that if I could do that to some capacity that it would, that I, I you know, it'd only be a matter of time before I started having good wins and started playing well and more consistently. Um, and, and, you know, you know, that's something that I definitely saw uh, in challengers is that you see guys and it's, it's sometimes it's sad where it's like that same recurring thing and you're like, geez, man, like it's tough to be out here, let alone to be out here, you know, doing the same dumb stuff and not, not learning and not improving in, in those ways. Right. But, you know, it's really difficult. It's really hard. And, and a lot of guys don't have coaches, you know, some guys do, but some guys just, they don't have anybody helping them or coaching them, you know, day in, day out because you can't afford it. And so that's obviously really difficult. And if you have a blind spot in some way, which, Again, I think a lot of us have blind spots and areas in their life that, that they that they kind of aren't as honest with themselves as they could be. And if you don't have a coach and somebody who's pointing those things out, it's like, how are you supposed to learn those things and, and make them? And it's tough. I, I've been there. But um, I think that's something that's really important to do. Gotcha. So basically, you're saying Hawkeye moved your ranking up 50 points <laughs> <laughs> or 50 spots. <laughs> um, I can definitely remember watching yeah. Challenge is where yeah. early, in, early in a lot of third sets, you know, questionable calls, you know, yeah. the, you know, the USA yeah. chapters, but, um, but anyway, I, uh, Hawk, I just Hawkeye is a blessing, man. That's for, sure. <laughs> that's for sure. It just helps you get over it. I mean, I that's the just, thing. I can, like, I can get over it one way or the other and I don't have to think about it. And it's not, it's one less thing that can, that can be a potential hangup, which gotcha. is good. And that would be something that, uh, 
definitely was recurring for me that that I would struggle to get over. Maybe not the first one, but but like number three or four, <laughs> I'd be yeah, I'd be it'd be tough. I'd be it would definitely affect my play. That's for sure. Right, right. I gotcha. So if there's one thing that's going to get you in the top thirty, is it just to keep doing the same stuff you're doing, learning from your mistakes and kind of just making those minuscule improvements, maybe mostly mental, like you're saying, or do you think there's one part of your game that you really need to kind of take it to the next level to make that next jump and even further? Right. Well, I think if I keep, keep working on my serve and making sure that that's as good as I can get it. um, You know, I think it's, it, my serve is shown to be a, a good weapon for me. And when I serve well, it's really tough for guys to get into my service games. Um, and so that's a big deal. So if I think if I can, can continue serving well and stay healthy, uh, you know, I, I would, I would love to see where I'm at in the next six or eight months because gotcha. I feel like I'm playing well and, and I'm as healthy as I can ask for. Um, obviously the mental side needs to keep, I need to keep a tight leash on that one because I'm definitely not going to sit here and say that I'm, I'm some sort of a, a healed, <laughs> healed and reformed player, you know, yeah. I, I have good moments and I have tough moments, but if I can make the good moments more than the, the ones that are, that are pulling me back, I think I'll be in good shape and just li- minimize and limit those moments where I'm not, uh, you know, being everything that I can, uh, right. mentally, um, yeah, just sure. making sure those are few and far between. I'm not, I, they're going to, it's going to rear its head out at some point, but as long as it's very, uh, minimally, then I think I'll be okay. Gotcha. And then finally, I know you're back in Nashville and you like coming back home, you know, when you have a couple of weeks off, but you know, what do you, what do you like coming back home for? I mean, I know a lot of guys, they, they choose to train not at home. Um, mm-hmm. so they, you know, go back and they always, you know, it's just training and then back out the tournaments, but you tend to like coming back home, kind of hitting the recharge button, right? Anything, anything that you get to do this week or, um, that just makes it even more special just being home. Well, Metallic is playing tomorrow in Nashville, so oh, wow. that's a uh, that's a big deal. That which doesn't happen every week. That's, that, that's sure. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of music in Nashville, though. But, but there's a lot Metallic. of music in Nashville, and this is my second concert in the last I don't know month and a half. We went to a Perfect Circle, uh, right. like, like two months ago, before right before the off season started. Um, but you know, I like I like sleeping in my own bed. I like going to the gym that's three miles from my house, and and. I like driving into Nashville. I live about 30 minutes outside of Nashville and I like doing the drive in the mornings to go to, to go practice, you know, put on a podcast, just kind of space out, um, do my own thing. You're kind of, you kind of get away from that whole tennis environment for, for those moments. And, you know, I, I think anybody who's seen like a tennis player's gym knows what I'm talking about, where you've got a lot of people doing a lot of different things. And some of it looks a little bit crazy, um, uh, with, with the tennis specific stuff. So it's nice to just be in a regular gym. Um, and have some home cooked meals for my mom. That's really nice. And spend time with my dog. You know, uh, the the little things that you just can't get on the road, uh, I can get at home, and you know, hang out with friends, um, see people that I don't get to see as much as I would like to. Um, you know, those things that kind of make you that that make you feel more human than than you do on the road sometimes. Because sometimes you feel like a a machine a little bit when you're out there, 35 weeks a year, just going to pl- from place to place and living out of a suitcase. You don't feel, uh, you lose a little bit of that human aspect, I think, that, that uh, you know, kind of helps ground you. So those are the things that I, that I enjoy. Gotcha. Well, very cool. I won't take any more of your time, but uh, really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I guess you said, uh, or you're playing New York next, is that correct? Yeah. New All York, right, well, Delray, Acapulco. All right. Well, good, good luck there. And, uh, you know, just uh, keep keep going and keep improving. We'll try to do. Appreciate it. Right, Thanks for having me on. All right. Sounds good.